Welcome to MZS. <laughs> 99 point whatever. Hi, I'm Miriam and this is Trials and Errors. And on today's episode, I'm going to talk to one of my favorite people, Shoshana Weissman. And what is Shoshana known for? Well, she's actually really well known by me and by others in my position for talking about a thing that we normally don't equate with justice or with criminal justice reform or how what she specializes in equates or intersects with criminal justice reform. When we talk about justice and justice reform, we can't just isolate that and put it into its own silo. We got to talk about economic justice as well. And did you know that you can actually be arrested for arranging flowers without a license? I didn't know it either. Watch this fantastic conversation with Shoshana and seriously learn about how we place these am amazingly enormous obstacles in the way of economic justice. I think though that in a lot of ways, we may seem to be an unlikely pairing, right? Oh yeah, for sure. Because of maybe the, the appearance of our politics. Yeah, for sure. But we have much more in common. Our end goals are the same. Exactly, yeah. Our end goals are, you know, equity and justice for all. We know that I, you know, I do like all the criminal justice stuff, right? And yeah. Immigration. But so what's your, where's your platform? What's your position? And how do you, how does what you do fit into all of this considering what people might think of your political affiliations? Yeah, for sure. Like how it fits into justice and stuff. Yes. So for licensing, it's just like injustice left and right. It's people like screwing other people and like making sure that people can't rise up without taking on enormous amounts of debt if they're lucky, um, you know, telling people, oh, you have to go this path. I know what's best for you. Um, and I, I know what's best for so society without any evidence, but um, they try to get people to assume there's evidence, um, just lots of barriers to entry. And that always ends up hurting marginalized people. Plus, like, I think everything I do ends up like, I, I try to help all things, but I really care about the things where it's like small people the most um, because big people can always like hire lawyers and stuff like that. And not that they should have to in a lot of cases with licensing, like, you know, a well-connected family can always get their kid licensed or um, a rich family, but um, a poor family who like, you know, they learned how to cut hair, they know how to do it, but now they have to go to cosmetology school, like screw that. And also with, uh, I mean, there, there's the, just, the obvious justice tie-ins too, where it's like we stop people from getting licenses if, they're, uh, if they've ever been convicted of anything for no reason, or if they don't have good moral character, whatever that is. And, and then even with Section 230, it helps the smallest people the most. Like there's so many communities online that exist because of it and that wouldn't without it. Um, whether it's people fighting diseases or, or people like the me too stuff it's all over i think in in pretty much most of the areas i work in the people who want to stop the good thing know what they're doing at least to a degree but they're doing it either for posturing to help out friends there's always some level of corruption there um with rare exceptions so for me i'm just like hey like let's let's let let's uh, improve flexibility let people do what they want as long as they're not hurting anyone and that goes back to my obvious libertarianism <laughs> Well, so, I mean, you said a lot, right? Like you said a whole, I mean, there's a, I mean, so we're going to take that and yeah. if, you, if you don't mind, like break it down Yeah, because a lot of people that I'm hoping to reach here are not lawyers. They're not involved. Yeah. Um, any of these movements, they don't understand. And so what, what we're trying to do is get them, well, get them on our side. Yeah, right? but the only way to get them on our side is for them to have a thorough understanding of sure. what you what you're talking about. So let's start with what is occupational regulation? Like what are occupational licenses? It's where uh, the government says you have to get a license from us in order to do the job you want to do. What are like what is the most outrageous occupational license that you've heard of? I think the top two are hair braiders and florists. Um, <laughs> hair braiders are licensed in many states, florists only in Louisiana. And no matter how many repeal efforts there are, they never repeal it. Um, it it's it's pretty bad. I think also to highlight just how bad it was in the or in the two thousands when. Um, when uh, the Institute for Justice was trying to figure out how they could get rid of it, one of the like wildest facts was that for the floral arrangement exam, the pass rate was lower than the Louisiana bar exam. 
Wait, a floral arrangement exam? Yep. And you have to explain this to me. I mean, I'm and I'm being like completely serious right now. You have to arrange flowers at, uh, before licensed judge it, li um, licensed florists, and they get to judge. Well, I mean, who? What? What is the? What is the criteria? Like what? Like they don't do give you any criteria. They don't list it. No, nope. you just have to make a floral arrangement that they like. And who? Who are the judges of this? Is it licensed florists? Ah. Yeah. And so, I mean, let's let's connect the dots here. Yeah, exactly. What I mean, the purpose of that is to uh, keep people out of their profession. Like that's all it is. Because if you can say no and and uh, to other people and keep people out of your profession and keep it tight, keep your costs high. Um, why wouldn't you um, in in that position? I mean, if you know, assuming you have no ethics or moral standards, why wouldn't you? You know. <laughs> And hair braiding, where is, I mean, do all states have licenses, need licenses for hair braiding? No, um, I don't think it was even all to start with, but especially over the, um, over the past like decade or so, they, uh, even states that had it got rid of it. So it's, we're making progress with that one, thankfully. Um, but uh, needless to say, it was used against African-American hair braiders. Um, one was even arrested, like arrested for braiding hair without a license. Like, could you imagine? Um, I mean, yeah, there's not a lot of white women getting their hair braided. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Professionally. Like maybe they just do like a little, you know. Right, right. Or like the occasional, like you want to feel 90s again. Right. You know? <laughs> right. Whatever. But the big demand is for African-American women who want to like make their hair easier to use or in a style they like. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, we, we punish uh, African immigrants for braiding hair without a license that doesn't teach them how to braid hair. So are there hair braiding schools or do they have to go to cosmetology school? Cosmetology schools and they don't learn to braid hair there. They just don't teach hair braiding. You know, there's lots of cool stuff you can do with hair that they're just not going to teach in those schools, which is fine, but then they shouldn't be mandated to have to right. go to those schools. Right. And there's not a floral arranging school either, is there? I'm actually not totally sure on that one. Um, so I know for the exam that they still have the written test. They got rid of the um, the arrangement exam, thankfully, but they still have a written test. And I'm not really sure what, what? you do to study what for it. What about? Yeah, you have to like take a quiz and a test. That I just, it's it's ridiculous. It's been so long since I looked I at it. But I love that. I mean, I'm going to go down that rabbit hole. That's going to be like... You've done a lot of work. So where did all this, where did all this come from? Like, why? What, what was the, gen I'm like, I'm seriously yeah. curious about the genesis of all of these, because you and I have discussed regulations, yeah. right? When you talk about regulation, people think like, oh, you want like lead in our water right, right. and you want, you know, landfills in urban areas or whatever, right, exactly. you know, but that's not, that's not what you're talking about. Yeah, it's, it's stuff that the government has imposed in arbitrary ways, usually to harm marginalized communities, sometimes just to harm anyone who isn't the big business. Um, you know, people always talk about how great it is to regulate big business, but you have to remember those apply to small businesses too. So sometimes it's just that regulatory capture. I don't think it ended up happening, but a perfect example of how this stuff can happen is in New Jersey, uh, PetSmart killed a bunch of dogs. They just straight up killed a bunch of dogs. Um, while grooming them, no one is sure what even happened, like how these dogs were killed, but they were killed. And it was a big scandal. So PetSmart said, oh no, you might want to license dog groomers. Wow. So of course they can afford that for their staff. They can have staff come on, get some training, become dog groomers. A 16 year old kid who has not killed dogs wouldn't have been able to do it anymore. They put an age limit on it for no reason. Most of these have arbitrary age limits of 18. Um, and again, there's no reason for it. Most of this stuff can be done by a 16 year old worthy to, you know, to go through school really fast and have the training or somehow have other knowledge of the thing. But that's how it happens. Someone messes it up. There's a moral panic. And then people plus government are like, oh, well, we'll just do what they want to do. Or um, or people don't understand how regulation actually works and they do that. Other times it's straight up racist, like relics of the Jim Crow era, um, like especially with hair braiding, the way it's been enforced. You can't like it's obvious what's going right. on there, um, especially because in, in a lot of statutes, they don't explicitly say hair braiding. Reading. Sometimes it's just they think um, they include all hair care, which did make it funny last year when Mark Zuckerberg, um, it, it, you know, it turned out that he was having um, his staff blow dry his armpits. If there was Wait, hair, what? Yeah, there was a story about that, that he gets sweaty a lot. So he'd have staff blow dry his armpits. But what you have to remember is if he has any hair there, that is illegal in, in all states. Yeah. Too. 
blow drying, hair wow. blow drying is illegal without a license in all states except I want to say Virginia and Arizona. So in my state, they can I can get my hair professionally blow dried. Oh, but what state are you in? Virginia. Oh, okay, okay. I, for some reason, I kept thinking New York, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in Virginia, you can um, you can hire someone to do it, and they won't be committing a crime. So it's all hair care, including yeah. all of your hair anywhere. That's the way the statutes are written, and as we know, if it's written that way, they're willing to enforce it that way. Um, right. Sometimes it's just bad legal writing, but like as it's written, they've enforced it against African hair braiders um, and and so many other things like that, where it's like you know it's it's obvious it applies that way. So even though they might not pursue you, they might, and it's that mm -hmm. uncertainty that gets a lot of people into trouble. Do I want to take the risk here? Um, you know, could I be uh, prosecuted for this? Is it worth that risk to make some money, or should I just go do something else where I don't have to worry about risk? Um, and for you know, someone just starting out, that's a lot of risk. Yeah, I mean, when you talk about barrier to entry, right? I actually want to pick your brain about yeah. sex work. So, what's your stance on that? I mean, there's really when you talk about having almost no barrier to entry. Yeah. You know, to me, that's like the number one work that a person can do to kind of put, you know, put food on the table and, and be able to survive and exist. And maybe even some, some cases really thrive. Yeah. You know, so what's your, what's the take on that? So I, I don't know as much about how regulations apply there. I do think there's a lot of hypocrisy where, you know, uh, pornography is allowed, but prostitution isn't, you know, um, I could see certain arguments being made, but on the whole, I feel like it's pretty hypocritical. Also, uh, I know, I think it was California was looking to license them to protect them, but like, that's not how licensing works because as we know, a lot of them are soft, they have aggressive followers and like, that's not a solution. So for me, just on the basic regulatory side, if we're going to regulate them more, more or in any way, we just need to make sure there's a means ends fit that if it's about protecting people, it's actually about protecting people and it's not going to have um, the unintended consequence of harming them. And that like, if there's a goal that that goal is accomplished. Um, and so many times it's like, oh, this sounds nice, but like, really, what does right. this thing do? So I, I apply it there just like I do anywhere. Um, but yeah, I've always just found it really hypocritical that if you're on TV, it's okay. But if you're not, it's not like I just, I don't really quite get that. <laughs> I don't, I don't either, but I do find it fascinating when we talk about ways in which people are prevented from making a living. Oh yeah, right. It 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 always involves the government. Always, and it's you know there's I'm all for different kinds of training. You know I don't I hated college. I didn't learn much there, and I really hated it. So I love trade schools, but even they can be abusive. Like there's these massive exposés on how abusive cosmetology schools are, how they're not really doing much for their students and not really helping them through the process. Um, and cosmetologists in particular can be particularly vicious lobbies. Um, they will go after you. Um, they've called like on Twitter, like when I've debated them on the issues, they call my hair ugly. Um, you know, I had, but it's funny because when they think I'm a cosmetologist because I have cool hair, they're like, oh my gosh, you, you, so you're a cosmetologist. You did that yourself. And I'm like, well, one of those is true. Like I did it myself, <laughs> but I'm not a cosmetologist. The lobbies that just get a lot of support that people won't stand up against end up becoming very entrenched and vicious. The florist lobby in Louisiana is very vicious. That's insane. Um, I know. Um, one, one other, I mean, there's so many regulations in this realm, though, that one other that I think is particularly relevant in our current era is um, home-based businesses. And I'm not talking about like running an Applebee's out of your living room. Right. I'm, I'm talking about like you have a client at a time or you even work from home alone. There have been multiple cases where um, people have gone after um, uh, where local governments have gone after people working from home alone, uploading a YouTube video or just uh, working home alone. Like it's ridiculous, but you need a license to do that uh, under statutes in many localities. Um, and during the pandemic, like you're creating risk for these people doing the right thing. Like it's crazy. Well, you know, it's a funny thing today in getting ready for this. I was actually thinking um, a prosecutor had asked me where to send a hard drive. Yeah. And I'm licensed in Maryland and New York, but not in Virginia. And technically, I'm not allowed to practice law from an office in Virginia right. unless I'm licensed in Virginia. So I told her to send it to the house because this is where I this is where we've been working from because this is where we live. But, you know, we're not allowed to do that according to right. 
the rules of where your physical office can and can't be, which is to me always seems crazy. You know, yeah. so if I live in DC, but I'm licensed in, you know, Montgomery County or in Maryland, and that's where I work. Right. Um, my husband happens to work in DC and it's easier, obviously. I can't work out of an office in DC at all. Yeah, so that's silly. The protectionism is really, I mean, it's tight in all of these industries. Oh yeah, from from you know everything from hair braiders all the way up to doctors and lawyers. There's so much reform to be had. Um, I had actually thought uh, uh, lawyers was going to happen before doctors, but it started to look like scope of practice, making sure medical professionals can work across state lines. That stuff is happening finally. And that's crazy too. I tried to find a therapist. Yeah, right? and I wanted a Muslim therapist. Yeah, you know, and there are not that many Muslim therapists in Virginia. But there are a, a bunch of them out of like Detroit, of course, right? Because there's a huge Muslim population. I didn't know that. Yeah. So they have a huge, they have a place called the Khalil Center, which I think is in Michigan. And it has all of these services and they're doing online therapy, obviously during the pandemic. Yeah. But they messaged me and they're like, we can only get grant you limited services if we do it online. And I'm like, it's crazy. There's states so finally the, working on this. The, what is the theory behind not being able to give, not, I mean, not a psychiatrist or, you know, giving me a physical exam, but telemed is great too. Yeah. It's so much easier. It's so much better overall. I hope none of this ever changes. I know, right? But what is the theory behind me not being able to see a therapist in Maryland? Aren't all the, like the parameters of therapy the same across state lines? Oh yeah, they're, they're more or less the same. There, there's, you know, changes here or there, but, but your point's exactly valid. And a lot of people have had issues finding therapists, just a shortage of them overall. And I never even thought about like ha finding ones who fit in your religion and will understand you better. Cause there's going to be so many things, whether it's gender, religion, just other understandings that makes perfect sense. And I'd actually never thought about it from that angle, but, um, Part of the thing is that it's good that states license people because if if uh, the national government did, it would be horrible. They right. mess up everything and it mm -hmm. would just be really bad. So it's good. I like that states do. Um, and we can also undo mistakes, try out different licensing schemes, different regulatory schemes, broadly see what works. Even if we're not always using the data, at least we have that data and someone can use it. But that's that's all it is, because especially, you know, years ago, people wouldn't have needed to, like, call someone up um, because all, all it would be is just a phone and people liked in person far, far better. But with the rise mm -hmm. of video and all different like tools to connect, even texting, um, the needs risen and a lot of the stuff just no one thought to write into law, I think. Um, so I think that's the big part of it. Then there are other problems. Uh, so with allowing professionals to work across state lines, usually lobbies are a little more open there because they see how it benefits them. But at the same time, they're worried about competition, right. um, which is again, where a lot of this goes back to. A lot of lobbies will say, oh, well, you know, that therapist won't know anything like a one who lives here and they're not held at the same standards. It's all BS for sure. But um, but it, it, these are really big issues. Like it, it's starting to change. There's also some insurance regulations that get to this, just the way we regulate insurance reimbursement and like the medical right. profession broadly is right. what's causing all the problems. So we need reform and some states are going for it. Um, in, in Arizona, hopefully there's going to be some really cool stuff this year because uh, Governor DC and um, the people he works with are perfect angels and I love them, right. but um, we need more of that. We need states to be more adamant about it. And you know, it's it's crazy that even in the pandemic, the stuff hasn't been fixed. It, it needed to be fixed years and years ago, but if not then now, and if not now, like as soon as possible, right. because people need this. You know, I have lots of specialists and I've been thankful to find really good ones in my area, but uh, growing up being super sick, I had terrible doctors and I would have loved to like, go to one far away, but that's right. just not really possible with my parents working and me homesick. So I'm big on as much flexibility in every industry as possible without harming people. And this is one of those really obvious ones. I will say too, the Trump administration did well with like waiving certain regulations there, but we right, need the telemed, the telemed yeah. regulations. Yeah. He was super proud of that. Yeah. And no, it was something like, he did. I liked. <laughs> well, I mean, it was, it was great, but it's really like a no, it was a no brainer. Yeah. You know, I mean, I don't know why it ever was an issue to just even say it's my yeah. doctor locally, even like to be able to just say, hey, you know, my throat is kind of scratchy. And he could just be like, well, if you have a fever, come in. But otherwise, take some Tylenol. You'll be fine. Yeah. You know, instead of like clogging up 
urgent care centers or you know even doctors' offices or ERs because yeah. people will end up going to the ER, you know, if they if they can't get an appointment. Oh, absolutely. And it's a it's a problem just all over. And what what's really bothered me though is that there's been, you know, it's great that governors waived a lot of these regulations in their states too, but it should be permanent. It like there's no reason for it not to be permanent. Um and I've been really disappointed by those who waived and didn't introduce legislation to change permanently. Um there there has been some really good effort in this area broadly. Um even uh getting rid of certificate of need laws, which all that says is like your competitors have to approve your business, which is ball. Um, it's horrible. And it exists in all different kinds of areas from like moving companies. Like, does this area need a new moving company? What the hell do you think other moving companies will say? But it's really big in healthcare where places, um, hospitals are limited to beds because of it. And during a pandemic, that wasn't really great. That to was have not a good laws. idea. Yeah, that's a really, and we know that rural hospitals are yeah suffering greatly, you know, and if they were even able to do telemed before, they probably could have devoted, you know, more time. Well, we also don't care about preventative health care. That, yeah, <laughs> there's many layers here. <laughs> well, that's, another, that's another whole, app, you know, video yeah. about, you know, and, and the like you talked about the insurance industry. I um, got my broker's license in New York just by paying New York State $300 because I'm an attorney, right? So I'm an actual real estate broker yeah. in New York. In Virginia, I have to take the entire exam. So I studied all this stuff. You know, I haven't taken the, the exam yet because I don't want to actually go in person sure. to go take a test right now. It's so freaking hard. Really? It's so hard. Like, it's just stuff on there that I'm like, why would I have to know how much, how big an acre is? <laughs> That's so right? bizarre. Yeah. And they, make you, and they make you, like, learn about what, like, the various kinds of surveys are, like, meets and bounds. And with all due respect to real estate agents, I've bought and sold houses. They don't know any of that stuff. <laughs> I mean, it's oh, like lawyers, yeah. like the bar exam doesn't oh, yeah. you know any of that stuff. Oh, exactly. And it, that's what kills me in so many cases that tests have no relation to what you're actually going to do. And so then what are we testing for? It's just an arbitrary barrier. Right. Um, even with cosmetology, like they don't, I don't think, I mean, maybe some do, but I've gone to so many licensed um, uh, hairdressers who didn't know how to bleach my hair. I have stronger hair. It just holds up better to bleach. And I'll tell them that I'm like, look, don't be afraid to blend in the roots because like, it'll be fine. Bleach the rest of it. They're like, oh no, if you if you bleach it, your hair will break. I'm like, no, it won't. Like I know my hair. So now I just bleach my own hair. I have one great hairdresser, but I've been trying to go out less. So I haven't gone to right. her, but she's really great. She's also licensed, but she's just better. So it's not like this minimum standard. It's like, you want to go to the person who's going to get your hair. She does her hair fun colors too. So she knows this stuff. Right. Um, Meanwhile, like, you know, they teach you all about health and safety and in cosmetology schools, uh, salons are known for spreading infection at enormous rates, like right. licensed salons too. So the licensing isn't even the fixing the thing they say it's fixing, um, which is why I advocate for like health inspections over licensing. Oh, that makes more sense. Because yeah. my next question was going to be, what are the alternatives to licensing? Because a part yeah. of licensing is just performative, right? Like, you stick exactly. a thing up on the wall and you're like, oh, this place is clean or this place is, they know what they're doing or they sanitize yeah. or whatever, right? No, exactly. And there's all kinds of alternatives. Like the Institute for Justice has this great inverted pyramid of least restrictive regulation. And not only is it less restrictive, but sometimes it's better. Like with salons, I would much rather than like be uh, dogged on, on, on random health inspections to make sure that they're cleaning everything right. Even sometimes those regulations can get crazy, but with how bad salons are, like go for it. Like that's great. Right. Um, even, you know, for licensed hair braiders, if the concern really is spreading disease, you know, do inspection, say, hey, like let's make sure that you have everything set up okay, everything's safe. I have no problem with regulations as long as it's solving a problem. My issue is when they say it's solving a problem and it's not. So like, with PetSmart and the dogs, you know, they could have uh, licensed them, but that wouldn't have solved the problem. Someone was killing dogs or at least a few people maybe. So that's the problem. The problem is not that pet groomers need to be licensed. Like that doesn't solve anything. Also licensing boards sometimes protect their own. So there's even less accountability in certain cases. So that's one thing too. But like with lawyers, like they're, they're forced to learn stuff they're never going to use. And to a degree, I understand you might want them to understand certain things, but like, you know, let them do apprenticeships instead of law school, because right. I have 100%. friends who, 
yeah, I have friends who um, literally at 17, 18 were working for lawyers and we're kind of like on the DL doing legal work because they learn from the lawyers. You know, let, allow every flower to bloom, allow every path to licensure if you're going to have licensure. You know, whether it's apprenticeships, just other ways to learn. One thing people don't even know about that is that veterans often can't get licensed in their field because army experience doesn't always count towards licensure. Wow. It's this one direct path, sometimes two or three if you're lucky, but generally you have to do these things to get here instead of like having to uh, prove that you know the thing. The, the schemes just don't make sense and there's no evidence. And also a lot of times if you listen to the hearings, you'll hear their real reasons. Back when um, the first time Arizona was trying to de-license uh, hair blow dryers, the cosmetologists spoke for themselves and one had said, well, do you really want immigrants coming and like painting nails like that? I happened? saw that. I remember seeing that on your yeah. Twitter feed because I remember thinking, I, I, I do specifically rec re remember those yeah. hearings. Maybe like last year or the year before. Yeah, I want to say it was like 2019. No, but sorry. Yeah, I remember those specifically because yeah. I remember saying, wait, are, are they talking about blow drying hair? Yep. And there was a bunch of them who were actually saying that they needed licensing for blow drying hair. And like, yeah. I just remember that. No, but that was exactly it. And, um, and you know, they're saying it's about this or that. It's all about competition. And in that case, competition from someone she didn't like. And I'm like, you're racist. Like, that's not great. I mean, keep talking because, like, you're making my point for me. Right. So often you hear things like that. Oh, do you want them doing that or whatever? Um, and it's disgusting because, yeah, like, if they're going to do it, like, do it. Like, um, I think my... Um, my hairdresser is Japanese and she's just awesome. She knows so much stuff. She's also the cutest thing. She dresses like she's 14 and like like with like baller stuff. And she just has like these big heels and this fire and she's like in her 60s. I love her. But and like, she makes you, I mean, you trust her because she yeah. feels good about herself. And we go to the hairdresser so that we can feel good about exactly. her. Exactly. what men think or other people think we don't do any of this for, I mean, maybe we do it for other women, <laughs> but we don't, we don't do it for them. Yeah. And like, you want someone who's going to get you. And in her right. case, I wouldn't care if she's like, no one cares if they're licensed. There's been studies that show people rely far more on reviews and not to say reviews are everything, but it can really help you find the right professional, even for doctors. I've gone to so many terrible doctors. Now yeah. I weed out the bad one with reviews. I have a dermatologist who like looked at my skin and he's like, you have PCOS, go to an endocrinologist. Oh, wow. I love him. I literally like send everyone there. I gave him a ton of followers because I'm like, this guy's great. There's all ways to to, to showing that someone really knows what they're doing. Like, like we're saying with the bar exam, with uh, cosmetology exams, the tests often have nothing to do with what you're going to be doing. And even with cosmetology, I know they work with heavy chemicals, but I work with heavy chemicals on my own hair. I'm safe. You can have a bad licensed cosmetologist. You can have a good like, you know, uh, bootstrap one like me when I do stuff for right. my friend's hair. It's just, we, we need to make sure that it's actually about fixing problems, not just because regulations feel good or sound nice or your conscience can rest easy. Life's difficult and complicated and we want to have every path for people to achieve their dreams. Like I get to do what I love every day. If I had to be licensed to do what I do, I'm not sure I'd be able to, or I would have chosen this path. I don't want to put barriers in the way of anyone's happiness and success. I want to talk about the ramifications for people who have criminal convictions yeah in getting licenses because you know we call them collateral consequences yeah of convictions and most of the time people have no idea you know they and they learn these skills sometimes especially in federal prison they'll have certain skills right they have you know you can take a manicurist right like aesthetician or all these other uh, classes that they can take and then they get out and so at the very top level um, when people uh, get out of prison and can't find a job, they can't find good work, especially if they have a family and need to make a little bit more, uh, they return to crime. Recidivism increases. Um, and it's because we're telling them you can't do anything where you can make any money. And, you know, you might say, okay, I don't want a car thief to sell cars. Okay, that that might be a reasonable one. It's someone who robbed a bank to work at a bank. Like, okay, those are narrowly tailored. Like, those things might make sense. Sometimes if you've had any conviction, you can't do, like, anything. Like, barbers were, were a big one. They trained um, in prison to become a barber. And when they got right. out, they weren't allowed to because of their convictions. Well, the, I think the sickest one, and this always just bothered me, it finally changed this year. In California, uh, they were fighting fires for like no money, like right. putting their lives on the line. Many of them died. And when they got out, they couldn't become firefighters, let alone that like they weren't being trained to do things that they would have a good shot at because like 
apparently the fire becoming a firefighter is really, really competitive. So, you know, a convictions aside, it's just a hard thing to do. And we're not setting them up for success. It's sadistic on just so many levels because we should want them to have lives and get back on their feet. Lots of people do it. When we put barriers in their way, uh, they can. Another great example is in Tennessee, there was a woman who wanted to become a radiologist. She had uh, been a prostitute uh, 10 years earlier. That was like her last conviction. So getting back on her feet, she couldn't become a radiologist because it was a sex crime. So we're not, and that's that's fortunate that it's that narrowly tailored because so often it's good moral character. When uh, New Jersey was going to license pool contractors, they were um, they had included a good moral character clause saying you must have good moral character to be a pool contractor. I mean, one, America has a great history of amoral pool boys. So that's just un-American. <laughs> and- I like what you did there. <laughs> and we have some good, overlays for that one. (laughs) (laughs) And two, do we care if like your contractor is a nice person, has ever had convictions? Like, you know, I guess if you care, you can look into it, but like, we shouldn't say, oh, you can never do this profession. And it's so many professions that have good moral character, which has no legal definition. It means whatever they want. So it's carte blanche, like, hey, whatever, I don't like you. Like, you don't get this license now. It's ridiculous. There was, I saw something that you had written about I don't know if it was pool contractors, but about emptying water out of your pools and that you might need a license. Oh, yeah. I think that one made a little more sense looking back on it. I think it was about like chlorine and stuff. So I'm like, all right, all right, I'll give you right. <laughs> because I was, that. I was like, so chlorine in the water, like if you just yeah. empty that onto your lawn, for example. Yeah, they just want to make sure that the chemicals are safe. So I'm like, all right, I'll give you guys a pass. Well, round up on our lawns. Yeah. <laughs> so? Yeah, no, it's true. There's there's not a lot of regulatory parity. It's like we can do something in one case, but not in another. And there's no really big differenti- differentiating reason why. So I, I definitely feel that. But at least I'm like, okay, there there's there's some connection there. We're not like going like full YOLO. Even the um the, there's a stargazing permit I was mad at, but I'm like, all right, like it's 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 a land use thing. I get that sometimes you want to like restrict land use so people can like register beforehand so you're not like harming the environment like fine um and and so you don't so if you go like there's that place in pennsylvania i think you can go to look at stars right and so if you had a lot of cars going out there you know with their lights on and everything else or people bringing out like lanterns it you wouldn't it wouldn't be this place where you went to go watch stars right i mean something dumb but (laughs) Yeah, it, it just it's seeing a stargazing permit. I'm like, guys, am I gonna have to come for you now? <laughs> what did they say? We'll, we'll put a pin on that and see, <laughs> right? And we'll circle back. Yeah, and see how that works out. Because are people like looking for stargazing businesses? Is that what it is? Like, no, it's an individual. Or just to go stargazing. To go stargazing. I, it's been a while, but I want to say it was like a land use thing that like uh, it would stop erosion, stuff like that, to make sure that like not too many people were going to one area at once. And there's a lot of parks have permits like that, and I can get okay. that. Um, what bothers me, though, is the photography, the photography permit where you need a permit to take professional photos. And I'm like, OK, that's stupid. And like oftentimes those apply to like local parks. And I'm like, guys, calm down about your park. Like... It's not that nice. Talk to me about cottage laws. Oh my gosh. Those are so weird. Like you can't like just sell food sometimes. Um, And people are like, oh, well, what if? And I'm like, there's just so many what ifs. Like I, I get stuff that's expired from the supermarket. Like I just, I don't know why we can't have people selling pies sometimes or lemonade. We like food in our own house. The yeah, lemonade. exactly. Oh my gosh. And it's, it's the, the food regulation area is just so crazy because you can't feed the homeless many times. Um, you need a special permit to feed them or like to make sure that like the food's good enough. And it's like, they're eating out of garbage. Wouldn't you rather them eat something that you prepared caringly to make sure that these people are okay. But yeah, like helping the homeless in so many cases is, is one of those things. And the the cottage laws kind of go into it. Um, lemonade stands, if you've heard of like how kids can't run lemonade since it's essentially the same thing but it's just so crazy like we make food for each other but for some reason when money's exchanged like we flip out and like if if your food causes harm there's courts and i know people don't want to go to court but that's what they're there for like if we're not if we just want this preemptive no harm can ever occur in this way we also stop a lot of innovation and a lot of goodwill and stuff like that 
um, it's not good. It, you know, we stop being neighborly and we stop innovating and doing stuff like on our own. We have, we assume and rightfully so that everything's going to be like a huge burden and there's going to be hoops to jump through. I mean, it, it is a good lesson for kids and lemonade stands like, hey, here's how regulations work and they're terrible. <laughs> and then they grow up and they're also libertarians. I mean, I'm not a libertarian, yeah. but I have, I have libertarian tendencies because yeah. I see what the government does to people. Exactly. And if you see how stuff works, it doesn't even mean you have to be libertarian. It's like just being realistic. Like, look, they do this and then it doesn't work. How about we do something that does work or stop doing things without a goal? <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, I all that. That. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I learned about cottage laws because I um, bake. And so I was doing things like more specifically for our holidays, like Eid, right? And like, yeah. now really like our new year and stuff. And people were like, you know, my cousins are like, you should, you should do this. Like you should yeah. you know, do this for for people. So I looked into it and I was like, well, I wonder if I can do it uh, like, like small, but I, I couldn't, like there was literally yeah. no way to do it in Virginia, even though Virginia has pretty liberal cottage laws. Yeah. So I went to go look at a commercial kitchen that I could rent. And I was like, this doesn't make, it makes no, it's so expensive. It, the, the, the hoops they make people jump through are crazy, especially with no evidence of harm. Like in uh, Georgia, um, a locality shut down um, Must Ministries sandwich program where they were giving sandwiches to needy kids. Not one complaint, not one single complaint. They shut it down because, oh, it's not in a certified kitchen. They're feeding millions of kids. Like this one church just miraculously, like their network was like, really feeding hungry kids and it was doing great and of course during the pandemic the government partnered with them and i'm like yeah you better partner with them instead of shutting them down right um and they made it work but i think they they dropped the amount of sandwiches they were able to make because people couldn't use their homes anymore i mean like it's just crazy like the the way we treat this stuff yeah there will be a little more harm but there will be a lot more good like we can't live the sheltered like nannied life like this by people who don't even know how things work and are afraid of their own shadow like you know government really regulates as though it's afraid of its own shadow well the thing is is that we we're okay with it i mean putting innocent people potentially to death yeah right for for the ends of whatever they consider to be justice finality etc cetera, etc cetera, but we won't let you maybe get an upset tummy because you ate, you know, a cake that somebody baked for you. Like I just, so I'm on the same page. I feel the exact same way. Like there's, there's no parody in it. Like nothing makes sense. It, it seems so arbitrary and often it is. It, it's funny. Um, Even as a vegetarian, I haven't gotten into cottage food laws very much, but I have gotten into states and the federal government trying to make it so you can't call a veggie burger a veggie burger. Cause Oh, what milk. if you me? Yeah. Milk. Uh, almond milk, uh, cauliflower rice. And I hate the rice lobby because one, um, they complain about cauliflower rice. Oh, how will people know what it is? It says cauliflower. Like if they're allergic to it and they're eating it, they're idiots. It's like we government cannot fix that. They have so many warnings on them. Like they can't, like they, there's no more they could do. But with uh, rice, they create rice milk and it's the most disgusting alternative milk there is. Like it's the only one I just can't drink. I think it's nasty as hell. So it's always funny that rice milk is like, oh no, not cauliflower rice, but here have our rice milk. Like, you know, it's fine. Um, and as a vegetarian, like I wouldn't buy all this stuff if I thought there was like the regular stuff in it. I buy it for the cashew milk because it sits better with me or the veggie burger because it doesn't have meat. If like they're trying to trick people, they're doing a really bad job of it. Yeah. Is it are people being tricked? I mean, is that like a thing that has happened? Like people have said, well, I bought this and I thought it was maybe like once ever, like, you know, it, it's the rare thing how we all buy stuff and we're like, oh crap, I meant to get this thing, not that thing. The lobbies really got to, you know, a lot of these people and say, oh, well, people are, don't know and it's not the same nutritionally. So they think, so they think that they're buying meat yeah, and they're not. So it's not like vegetarians are complaining right? because there's meat in their food. Right. right. You could understand if you like, for example, for religious reasons or anything else, but these are people that wanted the meat that weren't getting it or they want the dairy right. and they're not getting it. And they're the ones who are not complaining, but could complain. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, there's no epidemic of harm. There's really no harm happening, but you'll see in statements from different legislators like, oh, well, our, our cattle industry is sacred and we, you know, consumers deserve better. And I'm like, what the, li literally a sacred cow. I mean, like I can't come up right. with like- Well, the milk lobby, we know. I mean, that's yeah. like the first one you ever learn about, right? Yeah. Is like the dairy. I mean, if you, when you learn about lobbies, you learn about like- Right. Why they tell you, you need to drink milk. Exactly. Like, well, why am I shitting myself four times a day? And I'm always so gassy. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's oh, like, wait, we're not actually made to drink milk. Right. When we grow up. It's true. And it's, it's so funny because they always make a big deal out of it. But they're the ones kind of tricking people. Also, the whole breakfast lobby. I mean, like, oh, I don't. That's my favorite, too, right? <laughs> like, I like how they're, like, part of this balanced breakfast. And it's, like, all carbs, extra sugar on the carbs. And, like, and orange meat. juice. Yeah, yeah. Like, that's not fun for, like, anyone's body. <laughs> Or you know what what I was really surprised about, and I don't know if there's a, like a water lobby. Yeah. Like when when people started debunking the whole you need eight glasses of water and nothing else counts. And if you and then people oh, were like, yeah. no, because you get water from your food. And I was right. like, wait, 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 wait I, I, but I have to drink eight ounces of eight glasses of water a day. I just but I don't think that there's a water lobby. I mean, maybe there is because there's a lot of bottled water. So maybe but I think the water it's lobby different because it's a utility like utilities right. just lobby differently. Um, with with ag though, like it's just it's ridiculous. I, I my favorite is always rice, though. They had these long op eds about Oh, no, cauliflower rice people are being tricked. And then they sell rice milk. I'm like, you guys are assholes. Like, stop it. <laughs> where do where's most of the rice grown in America? I want to say Arkansas is one of the big ones for it. And I know there's other states, but it's like Arkansas is up there. Afghanistan grows its own rice. And okay. you know, they wanted to import rice from America to Afghanistan. And the Afghans were like, we don't want your <laughs> big little rice. Like, you could keep it over there. That's so funny. And you eat it. But yeah, I, I mean, I have all sorts of issues with with agriculture oh, yeah. um, and and a lot of people who you know decry welfare oh right? yeah of <laughs> course it, right so we're not going to pay what it's what a tomato is worth to an american farmer to grow oh, us yeah. a delicious tomato in america exactly no you're you're exactly right and it's like the, the i mean the farm bill speaks for itself and you see all the crazy stuff in there how like your mom's best friend's cousin can get subsidized if you own a farm like it's just right it's crazy right. um what was it um I, I, w I forgot what I was making a joke about, but I was like, maybe I should get like a mini horse like Arnold Schwarzenegger has. And someone's like, I bet you could get like some ad funding. I've talked to friends who like their family share a cow on their properties. So then they all get like these these uh, bailouts because of it. And it's like, you know, if it's there, take it. I get it. But like, yeah, the ag rules are ridiculous. And conservatives often stop being conservative when it comes to like ag. Um, and I love animals and plants. Like I want to pet everything more than eat it. But like... It's just, it, I get such a kick out of it, um, out of the dishonesty. I hate when politicians run with it, though. I'm like, you guys know no one's being tricked by veggie burgers. Oh, no, it's the word burger. You must use disc. And, like, people flip. So there's a couple of Twitter people flipped out over, too. I'm like, guys, why do you care so much? Like, are you working for them or what? <laughs> are there occupational licenses that you do think are necessary that actually are helpful for us? So I think at the top level, um, you know, I'm fine with doctor's licenses. I just want to make sure that, like, we're not, you know, crowding out nurses' ability to do their jobs or other specialists. And I also think some of the processes to becoming a doctor could be a little bit easier. Um, but, or, like, those licenses make sense to me. There's others that do, too, but I'm not, like... Part of the problem is when something's licensed in every state, it's hard to compare if it would work without licensing. Um, mm -hmm. With doctors, like, you know, you never hear of like a really good unlicensed doctor doing something great for someone. Like, that's not a thing. Yeah. I wouldn't go to an unlicensed doctor. I'm just going to be honest. Like, yeah, I would, exactly. I wouldn't do that. And in fact, I, the more letters they have after their name, the better I feel. Right. Like, FACS, da 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 da. Yeah. So I'm, I'm cool with them. And with lawyers, I go back and forth. Like, I think for now, but I think we should try ways to reduce the burden to create more tiers. So people who want to do lower levels of things and simpler things can just go and do that and also become licensed by apprenticeship and also like overhaul the bar, the bar exam changes. But I could see keeping licensure for the moment, at least. And then, uh, you know, th there's other professions too, like, you know, nuclear engineers and stuff like that. I, I get those, but I feel like there should always be like, we should make sure that every bit of their training is necessary for it or at least really helpful we should test different levels of licensing maybe in one state reducing it a bit seeing if it works uh like we're saying economic mobility is a consideration here so we need to try to find that lowest barrier but even when it comes to contractors i'm not convinced they need to be licensed registered with a state i could see so that um you know people are always worried that they'll skip out on town and i know they do that sometimes so regi registration is a lower barrier that makes more sense. Um, you don't have to go through the extra schooling and stuff. You might have learned to do it growing up. 
Um, Jesus was a carpenter, so that's always a good example of unlicensed common carpentry. Um, but all that together, and I think like it's just a lot of times we're using licensure as a proxy for something else, like a, for registration, for health inspections, but that doesn't solve those things. And then you're just adding barriers for no reason. So basically just when I consider if a license is worth it, um, is it being done well unlicensed anywhere? Is was one big question. Do all states license it so you can compare um, rates of harm? Is it stopping the harm that we want it to stop? And if not, then like, is there a different barrier or do we even need barriers because you can't fix that thing? And it, you know, if, if it's necessary, still figuring out like the best means ends fit. Um, like with cosmetologists and health inspections, how I think that would be better. You know, I'm not against licensing. I just think it's super, super overused. And where it is used, it's overly burdensome. So just trying to make the uh, the equation a lot better and, and uh, not using it as a proxy for everything. Thank you so much, Shoshana, for coming on. Oh. And is there anything you want to pitch? Anything you want to talk about? How can we find you on social media? Just follow our street at RSI and me at Senator Shoshana. Um, you can find everything from there. And if you have questions, always feel free to DM me too. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. I hope you enjoyed watching that as much as I enjoyed making it. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. I would love it if you subscribed and even more so if you left a comment. You can follow Shoshana Weissman. The link to her Twitter is down below. I highly recommend it. Thanks. Uh, wait, I want to say something else. Thanks. See you next time.